The Holy Gospel according to Mark. Some Pharisees came, and to test Jesus, they asked, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? He answered them, What did Moses command you? And they said, Moses allowed a man to write a certificate of dismissal and to divorce her. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. People were bringing little children to him in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. The gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, Christ. One of my wife's good friends back in Lexington has an only daughter that began her college career this fall. A week later, her husband came and told her that he's moving out and filing for divorce. Susan and I were both heartbroken to hear that news. I imagine we all know and love people who are divorced. Divorce happens. And it can be very traumatic, causing heartbreak, not only in the couple, but in children, parents, and other family and friends. And I imagine some of you listening here this morning have gone down that road yourself. Biblical passages like the one we just heard have the danger of judging and shaming those who get divorced. They might even be used to keep someone in a toxic and abusive relationship especially if you interpret what Jesus says as condemning divorce and thus anyone who gets divorced. But when we look a little deeper, we see that there's much more going on here in this passage. This issue of divorce arises from a question some Pharisees asked Jesus to test him. And it might be helpful to know that in Jesus' day, there's two competing Pharisaic schools of Shammai and Hillel that hotly debated the legal grounds for divorce. The scribal school of Hillel allowed divorce for any reason, and the school of Shammai allowed it only in the case of adultery. Jesus sidesteps being pulled into their debate in a very good rabbinic fashion. He asks them a question. What does Moses, the lawgiver, say? And they respond that he allows it, which prompts Jesus' response about how divorce goes against God's original intent and creation. In turning one scripture against another, he quotes directly from the Genesis passage we also heard read this morning. And I sense Jesus is pointing us all towards God's ways of inclusion and connection over the trauma of exclusion, shunning, and shaming. 
The line from the Genesis text that has been reverberating in my mind this whole week is that it's not good for man to be alone, and I think that applies to women as well. God's original intent for us is to be in community together, connection that is helpful and loving. And God continually moves through the whole arc of Scripture to heal brokenness and restore right relationship. You may have missed it, but Jesus also pulls a line from the first chapter of Genesis in his response to those Pharisees by noting that we human beings were created male and female. And so perhaps you can recall the emphasis in that creation story of how we're all created in the image of God. Jesus reminds us here that God's intent is inclusion over exclusion, connection and wholeness over abandonment and rejection, that we're all precious and sacred people. I believe that Jesus comes down on the side of marriage over divorce because God intends and desires for us to be in healthy, life-giving relationships, maintaining faithfulness and commitments that we make with one another. And I think Jesus knows full well the pain and trauma of broken relationships. He recognizes our human sinfulness as the cause when he tells the Pharisees that it's because of their hardness of heart that Moses allowed divorce. I wonder if Jesus might have been turning this test question about divorce into a deeper lesson about relationship with God. Throughout the Bible, the metaphor of marriage is used to depict faithfulness in the relationship between the people and God, highlighting either their commitment or lack thereof. Our hard-heartedness not only cuts us off from one another, it also cuts us off from God. When the people turned to worship other gods, it was often labeled adultery. And when Jesus' disciples asked him to elaborate about his answer to the Pharisees' question in private, he says, to divorce and marry another is to commit adultery. And I imagine this stings the ears of any who are divorced and remarried. But it might help to remember that Jesus also said that to look with lust is to have already committed adultery in one's heart. Adultery is any kind of break in faithfulness and purity. Salt that has lost its saltiness is adulterated. Anything that takes precedence in our lives and draws us away from God is adultery. As flawed human beings, we're all guilty of adultery. We all fall short of God's intent for living together in harmonious community. But that's not the end of the story we heard this morning. And I'm glad our gospel text today didn't end with Jesus' words about divorce being idolatry. And I don't think it's mere coincidence that, John, that Mark put these two stories side by side in the gospel. For in the second scene, people are bringing children to Jesus for him to bless. And the disciples rebuke them. They still don't get it. A similar modern scene happened uh, about six years ago when Pope Francis was visiting and on parade route in Washington, D.C., when a five-year-old American girl with Mexican roots got inside the police barricade seeking to give the Pope a yellow t-shirt and a note to ask for his support in asking our president and legislators to reform immigration laws. Well, the security detail saw her first and began to escort little Sophie Cruz away when Pro Pope Francis stopped them and, and then had them bring her to him. And then he gave her a hug and a blessing. Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. And Jesus took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. Yes, Jesus' disciples have a short memory. He's been all about connection, healing, and welcome, especially for the most vulnerable. 
Have they already forgotten his visual sermon following their argument over who's the greatest? When he took a child in his arms saying, whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. It's a visual sermon that bears repeating as he says, don't stop them. And then takes these children up in his arms and blesses them. Maybe his disciples will finally get the message. And he punctuates this visual sermon with a, in the Greek, it's a double amen statement, which we find translated, truly I tell you. It's Jesus' way of saying, pay close attention. This is very important. And then we hear, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. Receive is an operative word here. We can't earn our way in by our effort or our good behavior. In order to receive the reign of God, in order to follow God's will, we must first let go of our self-reliance and even our being in control. (laughs) This is what we're asking when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done. Whether we realize it or not, It's a complete overhaul that we're requesting. As children, fully dependent on God for all we need in life, we're freed to be our most loving, carefree, truest selves. God then sends us forth in the world to expand this welcome and to show forth God's reign in all we do. Yes, all are welcome. The divorced, the drug addicts, the soldiers, the politicians, the LGBTQIA folks, the Pharisees, the self-made men and women, the very old, the very young, the unemployed, the CEOs, the winners, the losers, the cheerful and the grieving, the hard-hearted and the tender-hearted. All are welcome to receive God's life-giving reign. Jesus knows the torn flesh pain of divorce and of all broken relationships. Jesus knows the torn flesh of immigrants and refugees seeking new places to call home. Jesus knows the pain of those suffering from COVID and the trauma of losses is brought upon us all. Jesus knows our pain, the hurt and heartache of our human condition. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He cried from the cross. But that was not his final word. Through Jesus' own broken, torn flesh, we are made whole. The broken relationships we have with ourselves, with God, and with others become reconciled whenever we receive the unlikely gift of his very own death and resurrection. Jesus invites us to climb into his loving arms and receive our blessing at this table of reconciliation. Here, all are welcome. Here, through bread and wine, Jesus' story becomes our story, and our torn flesh becomes one flesh in and through him. I think there's a little child in each of us that yearns to climb into Jesus' lap and be blessed. Can you picture yourself there? How about your greatest enemy? A restored and right relationship with God, with others, and the whole created order is what God intends. Not torn flesh, but one flesh. It's not good for man or woman to be alone. God faithfully gathers us into community to practice the healing power of Christ's love. Today, may we once again receive Christ's blessing and then go forth turning outward to bless the world. Amen.